Welcome back into Thimbleberry U. I'm John J. Gay. I'm joined by Amy Wallace from Thimbleberry Financial. Amy, always good to be with you. Chag, it's always great to talk with you. And today we're talking about tender offers, which I think is probably pretty prevalent in some of the clients that you deal with in some of the industries that you do a lot of work in, right? Yes. Tender offers pop up in different areas. Today, I really wanted to talk about those that come from companies, especially employers, Mm -hmm. towards the employees. So let's start right at the beginning. For those of our listeners who may not be familiar with this, what is a tender offer? Well, let me go to our good old dictionary called Investopedia for this. And they say a tender offer is a bid to purchase some or all of the shareholder stock in a corporation. Tender offers are typically made publicly and invite shareholders to sell their shares for a specified price and within a particular window of time. The price offered is usually at a premium to the market price, meaning higher, Mm -hmm. and is often contingent upon a minimum or a maximum number of shares sold. So basically, it's the idea that someone comes in on the actual corporation or someone else and says, hey, all you shareholders, we want to buy your shares back for a set price. And their goal is to... One, take some of that money off the table, if you will, if it's the corporation, but also they are expecting the stock price to go up in the future beyond the premium that they may be offering, right? Um, So they're expecting to make money and take advantage of a situation where people want cash now. So in a way, it's a gamble on both sides. It's a gamble from the people proffering the offer to you, thinking that that stock price is going to go up. And then you're, if you take the offer, you're also taking a gamble the other way. Do I have that right? And that's a great way to say it. So I'll give you an example. I'm going to go out on a limb, Amy, and guess that you are not a big sports gambler. I am not. Okay. I just dabble in it a little bit here and there, you know, not too much for the sake of my marriage, but, you know, I'm a big football fan, so I'll throw a few bucks on a game here and there. And a lot of these betting websites, what they'll do is they will offer to buy your bet back. So for example... I'm a big Patriots fan. I bet 100 bucks that the Patriots are going to win this Sunday. Okay. Depending on how things are looking, they might say, okay, you bet 100 bucks in the game to win 100 bucks. We'll buy that bet back from you for 90 if the things aren't looking good. Or if things are looking really good, we'll buy that bet back from you for 110. Okay. You know, so it kind of will change depending on the circumstance, the situation. Or if you bet on somebody to win the Super Bowl early in the season, depending how the season goes. They may offer you more or less than you put down on the bet because the same dynamic is at play. Mm -hmm. They are taking a gamble that it's going to go one way. And if I take this offer, I'm taking a gamble that it's going to go the other way. Yes, you are correct. That's how it works. I think there's other reasons, though, that people take the tender offer, which we can talk about um, other than placing the bet. But in, in essence, yes, that is ultimately what someone is saying and the corporation is saying. With that definition, too, that I read that I I think this is important to clarify, sometimes tender offers come from non-public corporations. When we think about shareholders, we think of public corporations, publicly traded corporations, and you can get a tender offer before a company is publicly traded. That's important to note. I'm glad you said that. Is there a general rule, Amy, like a rule of thumb to think about in whether or not you should accept one of these offers? I really wish there was, Jag, but unfortunately, no. You're going to tell me it depends, aren't you? I am. My favorite answer. There really isn't. It comes down to personal situation and goals. Okay, so with that in mind, what types of goals and aspects of your personal situation should you be considering when thinking about whether or not to take one of these offers? So I think first, you have to think about the goals. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to assume this is a fairly sizable amount of money for someone. Sure. Okay, because most often when we see it in tech, the conversation ends up being a large portion of their net worth that we're talking about. And I do see this most often with our tech clients. So the first thing is, what's the purpose for the money? Are they wanting to be able to be financially independent now and leave the firm and not need to worry about working ever or in the next two or three years? Or do they have some other goal, like they want to build a house in Alaska and, you know, continue to work remotely, but don't ever want to have to make much, you know, to make that dream work. And that's what they want more than anything else in the world. So you have to assess how big the goal is compared to the dollars 
that are being offered and how important that goal is to you now or in the near future. So you're talking about weighing the short term versus the long term. If this is a chunk of change, a windfall, as we've talked about before, in a way that might be helping you do something short term. I'm going to say Hawaii instead of Alaska, but either is fine, depending on your preference or, you know, the way the real estate market is all over the country right now. Maybe it's you really want to put a down payment on that first house. Mm -hmm. So maybe there is a short term goal that's really important to you that it is more of a priority right now than something down the road. Yep. And so in looking at that, if the money is going to let you meet your goal and you'll be satisfied with that, then taking the tender offer might be the right decision for you. Mm -hmm. That said, if it only gets you partway to your goal and you're looking at it and saying that goal is so important to me that unless I can achieve it, this isn't worthwhile, then the tender offer probably isn't worthwhile to take. Okay, the long term is more important. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, you want that outcome in its complete form so much that only getting halfway there with the offer might not make sense for you. Really here, the decision comes down to risk, right? Do you want what you want and can make it happen today that you're willing to give up something potentially even bigger in the future? Could also be something smaller. True. So you're willing to turn in the chips now. Or are you willing to say, I'm going to take the risk because... My life is not going to be complete until I can accomplish this. And this offer just doesn't get me there. It's a really good way to look at it. Again, we come back to it depends. Yeah. So, Amy, I'm a shareholder in stock. I receive a tender offer. What steps should I take once I have the offer in front of me? First, I think it's taking inventory of the shares you have. Okay. So are these actually stock shares? Are they incentive stock options? Are they RSUs? Or do you have non-qualified stock options? What kinds of shares or equity compensation do you have in its entirety? And what is your financial situation even outside of that? Mm -hmm. Next thing is with the shares of this company that you have or the equity compensation, what does the tender offer actually apply to? What do you mean by that? For example, um, one tender offer we saw recently did not actually deal with stock per se, because the company wasn't publicly traded yet. Okay. So it had to do with the shares from incentive stock options. Mm -hmm. They also were issuing RSUs. So it did not apply to the restricted stock units or the RSUs that employees had, but it did apply to the incentive stock options. So you actually had to break out all of the shares into what kind they were And then say, now I have this tender offer that applies just to these particular types of stock. Amy, I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole here, but I do have a follow-up question for you. And that is, if the offer only applies to certain types of stock, whether it's ISOs, RSUs, or actual stock, how would that figure into the decision as to whether or not to take the offer? Yeah, it figures into the decision because, let's say it applies just to the incentive stock options or ISOs. So... If that's the case and you still have RSUs over here on the side, you've got other money that maybe you're counting on the company going public in this example. So when they go public, these shares will now have value because until they go public, there's no value there. Ah. So you can look at that and say, okay, what's my expected value here that I'm going to get at a point in time in the future that you may have some idea about when that is, or you may say, I have no idea. And then you can look at the incentive stock options if that's what this applies to and say, okay, if I have all of these shares, what happens if I tender 25% or 50% or 75%? And in doing that, you have to look at what the tax implication of tendering those shares is, Mm -hmm. right? Because taxes are going to be due because you're going to get money back. And they're all different depending on the type of stock. Yep. And- you then have to understand what your bottom line is, right? Because you can look at this and say, wow, this is $3 million. (laughs) It might really only be at one and a half million dollars after taxes. Ah. And I'm using some big round numbers here, but you've got to look, I think, look at the tax implication first. And then what is your outcome from this? Because everybody will look at, oh, here's how much I'm going to get. But if you don't go far enough, you don't realize what you're actually left with to then say, how does that now apply to my goals? 
So we talked about the upside and the windfall and even after taxes, the money you could walk away with. As you mentioned, a lot of these offers are big money offers. What would the downside be of accepting one of these tender offers? First, that it's irrevocable. So if you accept it, you can't undo it. There's no take backs. There's no mulligans. Absolutely. You're into the sports analogies today. I love it. (laughs) Second thing is you get this tender offer and you start dreaming, right? You've got these goals and, and dreams that you have. And because you have this money sitting on the sidelines, anticipating, for example, in the the scenario we've been talking about where it's incentive stock options and you also have RSUs, you've already had some thoughts around what you're going to do with this money. And once you get the offer, most people are going to think even harder about that, right? So now as you've debated, do I tender these shares? More than likely what has happened is you've become more emotionally attached to this dream. And so If you say, I'm going to tender, let's say 10,000 shares, and that's going to get me X, Mm -hmm. you tender those, there's no guarantee that it goes through. What do you mean by that? What I mean by that is that, let's say it's your employer that puts out the tender offer. Mm -hmm. And they say, hey, here's an offer to buy back 200,000 shares. And you say, okay, I'll tender 10,000. Well, There's a time frame on this offer that you and everyone else who got it has to say, okay, here's what we'll give you, right? Well, that may end up being 400,000 shares that everybody together collectively says, here we'll tender. So now there's a choice that may have been outlined in the documents or may need to be made by the employer. And that is how are they going to decide which 200,000 shares they actually buy back. Okay, I want to step back here for a second and make sure I'm with you because this is really important and and very eye-opening to me. So company says, I want to buy back 200,000 shares. All the employees get together and in total, they say they offer back 400,000 shares. The employer then comes back and says, okay, which 200 of these 400,000 do I want? And your shares may not be part of the equation. Exactly. It may be on a first come, first serve basis. Ah. It may be that they say, okay, well, easy answer here is we're going to tender 50% of what everybody offered to tender. So not only might you not have all the shares taken up on what you're offering up, you may only get half of what you thought you were going to get. Exactly. So the downside in that is you may not end up with what you're expecting in order to accomplish what you are wanting to accomplish with the money. This just got a lot riskier than it was 10 minutes ago. (laughs) And one final point, Amy, and this is something we've talked about on a podcast recently, and that is even if you get what you're expecting to get, windfalls in our previous episode we've talked about, you may psychologically spend this money a couple of times. You may think, oh, I've got this money coming in. I can go afford X right now. And then when the money comes in, I'll go buy Y. So I would encourage anybody who hasn't heard our previous episode on windfalls to go back and listen to that one because you can psychologically spend two or even three times money that you have coming in, which is another risk. Absolutely. I'm so glad you brought that up, Jag, because it does happen. I think when people anticipate that they're about to get money, oftentimes their choices change in terms of what they're purchasing. It can be conscious or unconscious. You may be saying this is for X, Y, and Z, but you make some choices ahead of time that use up some of that money. I even can tell you as a solopreneur, if I know I've got a big check coming in for a big client project, I might be more likely to take my wife out to dinner that weekend before the check even comes. So I know exactly what you're talking about. Bottom line, Amy, this stuff can be really confusing. There's a lot of uh, variables and changing dynamics in an offer like this. So whether or not you are getting a tender offer or have questions, generally speaking, about planning your financial future, Amy is the one to talk to at Thimbleberry Financial. How can people find you? They can give us a call at 503-610-6510 or find us on the web at thimbleberryfinancial.com. Great stuff as always, Amy. We'll talk again soon. Sounds great, Jack. Thanks. Registered representative securities offered through Cambridge Investment Research, Inc., a broker dealer, member FINRA SIPC. Investment advisor representative, Cambridge Investment Research Advisors, Inc., a registered investment advisor. Cambridge and Thimbleberry Financial are not affiliated.